and thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you to the Mount for inviting me. Um, I'm sort of in disbelief every time I have an event like this uh, these days because, um, you know, I, it's hard for me to think about myself as part of the, the legacy of Edith Wharton being here because my, my own uh, um, trajectory as a writer has been very unconventional and until really recently nobody recognized me as a writer. Um, so, you know, it's like I, I have done very little formal study of creative writing. I never did a BFA or an MFA. Um, I didn't have an agent. I didn't want one. <laughs> um, so I, I sort of wanted, I guess I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the trajectory of how this book came to be. And since it's a memoir, I have to sort of do that by telling you about my life <laughs> and how I sort of came to be standing here today. Um, so I, I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey through my intellectual genealogy and this unconventional path I took to becoming um, what, what I'm now starting to accept that I am, which is a, a writer of creative nonfiction. Because until really recently, I didn't even have an identity as a writer. I just thought of myself as a sort of a renegade sociologist. <laughs> um, and so I, I, along the way, I'm going to sort of pay homage to some of the teachers that I've had as well. Um, but let me start by telling you a little bit about where I grew up. I grew up in a small town called Chehalis, Washington. It's a rural town of about 5,000 people. It's exactly halfway between Seattle and Portland on the I-5 corridor. Um, and this was during the 70s and 80s. At the time, I mean, it hasn't changed that much, but at the time, I would characterize it as um, a conservative logging and farming town, almost entirely white. It was my father's hometown. He was a white American merchant marine who met my mother in Busan, Korea. And he brought us to Chehalis when I was a toddler. And so we were one of very few immigrant families or families of color to live in Chehalis during my childhood but particularly when we first arrived. So it was 1972 when we arrived there. In the 1970 census, for example, there were only four Asian people living in Chehalis. They were all Japanese. I never met them, never heard of them. Um, my suspicion is that maybe they were um, agricultural workers and that they had left by the time my family arrived there. So to my knowledge, um, we were the first Koreans to arrive in this town. And so I want you to sort of get a picture of my mother in this context. She was an outsider, not only to that community and new to the US, but she was also an outsider to my father's American family. And he was a merchant marine, so he was gone six months out of the year. And so my mother experienced these periods of extreme isolation under these conditions. The public school system of Chehalis sort of reflected the demographics and the politics of the town as a whole. Although, although there were actually more children of color than there were adults because there were several families that had adopted Korean children and there were at least two families that had adopted black children. I have no memory of ever having studied anything in school that reflected who I was or where I came from. I remember that in, high, in my high school history class, I was taught that slave rebellion, rather than slavery, was morally wrong. In high school, all the literature we read was by dead white men. I had never heard of Edith Wharton. And the only time I ever read a woman writer in high school was when I became really interested in Emily Bronte because I was a fan of Kate Bush. And so her song, Wuthering Heights, made me want to read the book. My high school had a graduation rate of about 75%. And among the graduates, 25% went on to college. So it wasn't really the kind of school that catered to aspiring writers and artists. It was mostly designed to sort of prepare kids to take over whatever their family business is or to enter the logging industry. Um, and I, you know, I sort of look back on the high school curriculum as highly problematic in the sense that it perpetuated symbolic violence against the oppressed and marginalized. However, in some ways, my education was decent because the teachers were very committed. 
and they seemed to recognize something in me that was worth nurturing. I recall a couple of instances of doing creative writing exercises in school. Once was in the fourth grade. I still have the short story that I wrote in fourth grade. And the second time was in junior high school, when Rebecca Brown, who was a then up-and-coming writer from Seattle, came to teach a workshop at my school. And that was the first time I remember vocalizing that I wanted to one day move to New York City and become a writer. Rebecca Brown said, you would fit right in there. I had no idea what she was talking about, but it sounded good to me. <laughs> so by the time I got to high school, I started to write on my own, but it was as a way of soothing my pain because the people in my family were either ill-equipped to do that for me or they themselves were the source of the pain. So if you read Tastes Like War, you know that my parents did not know what to do when I was sexually assaulted at the age of 15, and it became one of many taboo subjects that no one ever talked about. Also, during that same year, my mother began to first show signs of what Western psychiatry calls schizophrenia. And my father and my brother attacked me and called me a liar for naming that which was very obvious. So then, because I didn't get any help from them, I went to the local community mental health care center to talk to a counselor on my own. And the, the man that I spoke to basically told me that there was nothing that they could do for my mother and that it was too late for her. And so I look back at that moment, and I write about this in Tastes Like War, as um, the, the origin of my Han, which is a Korean concept which is often described as something that's sort of untranslatable, but one, um, one effort at a translation is that it is knotted grief that cannot be untangled or unresolved resentment against injustice. So when I was in high school, I didn't yet realize it, but I started to use writing as a tool for loosening that knot. And so in, I, didn't, I don't remember doing any formal creative writing when I was in high school, but my teachers identified me as a student who had potential in writing. And the school funded my participation in a week-long creative writing camp with other high school students at Centrum in Port Townsend, Washington, a beautiful Victorian seaside town on the Olympic Peninsula. I came away from that experience feeling pretty special. And then I spent the next year and a half taking for granted that I would become a writer, that I was a writer. Then, in 1989, I enrolled at Brown University as a fresh-faced, first-generation college student with the intention of studying creative writing. However, I was taken aback that I couldn't just register for the Intro to crea Creative Writing class. I had to submit a writing sample, and I got rejected. So I took that as a sign that I wasn't supposed to be a writer after all. Because here I was at this fancy college, and whoever was reviewing the writing samples looked at mine and did not see the potential that my high school teachers had seen. And so, of course, I gave more legitimacy to the fancy Ivy League college than I did to my little my hometown high school. So I put creative writing out of mind until the end of that school year when I took a job cleaning dorm rooms after the other students vacated for the summer. There was one room that was particularly filthy. Aside from the kind of filth you might expect from a freshman dorm room, I also vacuumed up an excessive quantity of feathers from under the bed, and I scrubbed candle wax off the floor. And as I was on my hands and knees doing that, I noticed what was written on one of the papers that was under the bed. It was an assignment from the creative writing class that I had been rejected from. And I couldn't resist reading it. And after I read it, I thought to myself, I could do better than this. <laughs> and so that was my first salient memory of asking who sets the standards against which we are judged. However, the epiphany did not motivate me to try again to get into a creative writing class. And if I'm being honest with myself, it was because I was afraid of the rejection again but I had already started to turn my energy towards another career path of social justice and education um, in immigrant and refugee communities. 
And it was through the lens of that work that I began to think about the social context of my mother's life, though there was so much that I didn't yet know about her when I was in college. So I'm going to tell you about another traumatic awakening. The first one was the year I turned 15, when I realized that my mom had schizophrenia. But the second one was the year after I graduated from college and my mother stopped going outside. So the last time she ever went out, aside from any, anything that she described as absolutely necessary, meaning going to the hospital or the psychiatrist or moving from one home to another, the last time she went out on her own was on Christmas 1993 when I went to see The Fugitive with her in the movie theater. So in, by 1994, she entered psychiatric treatment for the first time, and the drugs made her feel worse. A few, month, a few months later, she took all of her pills at once, four bottles. It was by her bedside in the hospital when I said to her, moments after she regained consciousness, that I'd do anything she asked me to. I'd go to Harvard, I'd get a PhD, anything at all to try to soothe her pain. It was that same year that my sister-in-law told me about my mother's past working in the sex industry for US troops in Korea. My Han grew and became more entangled with my mother's that year. And instead of just trying to loosen the threads, I became very curious about each of these threads. And then I started to think that maybe I could trace the origins of them. So my coming of age was really centered around investigating the past and more specifically, a past that had been hidden from me, which my mother could not or would not talk about. So the project of trying to give my mother something to live for also turned into my own project of inquiry. And so a year later, there I was in a master's of education program at Harvard, trying to please my mother. I experienced profound alienation there, partly because Unlike Brown, there was really a lack of interrogation of privilege of any kind at Harvard, uh, at least in the program that I was in. And it had been almost two years since the revelation about my mother's past, and the weight of that history was really bearing down on me. However, there was this one class in which we were taught to think critically about our positionality. It was a class taught by a visiting professor, a Puerto Rican woman named Eileen de los Reyes. She asked us to write a political autobiography, and it was the first time I wrote about my mother's history and my awareness that my existence was an effect of US imperialism. She also assigned bell hooks teaching to transgress. One essay in particular spoke to me, Theory as Liberatory Practice, which opens with the words, I came to theory because I was hurting the pain within me was so intense that I could not go on living. I came to theory desperate, wanting to comprehend, to grasp what was happening around and within me. So I read several more of Bell Hooks books after that. And another one of her ideas that became a lifeline for me is elaborated in the essay titled Choosing the Margin as a Space of Radical Openness which appears in the book Yearning, Race, Gender, and Cultural Politics. And here she was addressing an audience of black artists, but the words still resonated deeply with me. She wrote, our living depends on our ability to conceptualize alternatives, often improvised. Theorizing about this experience aesthetically, critically, is an agenda for radical cultural practice. For me, this space of radical openness is a margin, a profound edge. Locating oneself there is difficult, yet necessary. It is not a safe place. One is always at risk. Marginality is also the site of radical possibility, a space of resistance. So these texts allowed me to transform my own experiences of pain and alienation by perce perceiving them through the lens of possibility rather than deficit. Mm 
And so after reading all of these books by Bell Hooks, I got this notion that I just had to meet her. And so I moved to New York City on the last Friday of August 1996, slept on my friend's couch in Sunnyside, Queens, and then the following Monday morning, I called up City College and I said, because Bell Hooks taught there at the time, I said, I have to meet Bell Hooks, how do I do that? And they said, well, she's teaching in such and such a room at whatever time it was, I can't remember, 12 o'clock, 10 o'clock, something like that. And so I just packed my bag, got on the subway, showed up in her classroom, and then I introduced myself as somebody who was a huge fan, somebody who's, whose life had been changed by reading her work. Um, I was starting a job the following week, so I couldn't take that class that I had shown up to. But she said to me afterwards, next semester I'm teaching a Sunday seminar on the nonfiction work of Toni Morrison at my apartment in Greenwich Village, and would you like to join me? <laughs> and so I said, yes, I would like to join you. I called up City College to uh, find out about doing the paperwork to register for that seminar, and the male sounding voice at the other end of the line said, yeah, that's a nice racket she's got going on there. Over the next few years, I would hear this kind of disparagement repeatedly from usually white men. Um, for example, during the first year of my doctoral program, when I introduced myself to a white male professor as a student of Bell Hooks, he said, well, Bell Hooks isn't really a scholar. So what I learned about her and her reception in academia was that um, she, because she rejected the conventions of academia in favor of creating a space beyond the boundaries of the institution, the people who were the gatekeepers of that institution felt very threatened by her. And so this was one of the life lessons I learned from being her student. It was really an incredible education just to be a part of her world. And we talked about a lot of things, including all the drama that was happening in my family at that time in the late 90s. So, um, you know, she gave me sort of a lens through which I later sort of interpreted some of the things that you might read about in Taste Like War. She gave me books to read, including um, the book Dictate by Teresa Hakyang Cha, which later became one of the most influential books in my work. And in her company, I had started to see myself again as a budding writer because she would often start sentences with, you know, Miss Grace, one day when you write your books, and she would always say when, not if, and always books in the plural. And so her mode of teaching took the form of friendship, love, and community, which was in sharp contrast to what you typically find in academia, and especially the first year of my doctoral program in sociology at the CUNY Graduate Center. My first semester as a doctoral student, during that time I, I wrote a paper about how the white male gaze upon the Asian female body was rooted in US imperialism in Asia and militarized prostitution for US troops stationed there. It was my first attempt to write research about my family history, though I didn't yet acknowledge my personal connection to the topic in the paper. The professor responded, quote, do not lapse into hyperbole. I know many interracial graduate student couples at Stanford who do not have this type of unequal power dynamic. She then went on to say, I had the makings to become a good sociologist if only my writing and thinking could be properly disciplined. As it was, my writing was not social scientific because there was just too much passion in it. So I think back at my first year sociology program as training in anti-creative writing. <laughs> and I thought about leaving, but I reminded myself that I never had any interest in becoming an academic and that my reasons for entering the program were to give myself a structure in which I could study my family history and to give my mother something to feel good about because this was her dream that her daughter get a PhD. I also reminded myself that I was an outsider from the beginning and that Miss Bell had taught me that there is in the margin a space of radical openness. I reminded myself of that lesson. So in my second year, I found that space of radical openness in the classroom of another iconoclastic feminist thinker, Patricia Clough. 
She became my advisor through the rest of graduate school. In a class on trauma and the unconscious, she assigned students a final project of writing ethno autoethnographies of trauma. In Patricia's words, autoethnography's aim is to give a personal accounting of the observer, which is typically disavowed in traditional social science writing. It does this by making the ethnographer the subject object of observation, exploring experience from the inside of the ethnographer's life. So I think of that assignment as my first piece of creative nonfiction, although we didn't call it that, we just called it autoethnography or we called it experimental writing. And so my beginning doing creative nonfiction was sort of within, um, you know, within academia, ironically. And as I wrote in Taste Like War, Patricia hadn't anticipated that I would, uh, that I would apply that method of experimental writing to my dissertation. So in my dissertation, which later became my first book, I focused on the figure of the young Gongju, which is a Korean word that literally translates as Western princess, but more commonly translates as Yankee whore or GI bride. And I argued that this figure is a ghost that haunts the Korean diaspora. The figure is hyper visible, but again and again made to disappear or pushed into the shadows. She was erased from the U.S. discourse of the Korean War, U.S.-Korea relations, and sociological discourses of immigration and Korean America. This shadowy figure, I argued, was built from layers of collective fantasy, but also a representation of roughly a million real Korean women who provided sexual labor for U.S. troops between 1945 and primarily the late 1990s, but there are still women who do this today. She was also a representation of 100,000 real Korean women who married American men and migrated to the U.S. She was often the first link in her family's migration to the U.S. and thus the backbone of Korean America. But even within these communities that would not have existed without her, she was shunned. Korean American families often referred to these women as quote, the shameful family secret. Indeed, in my own family, there are people who are deeply invested in keeping my mother and the truth about her life a secret. As the subject of this serial erasure, this figure left behind a kind of spectral trace that would animate the next generation. And so in my dissertation, I use this concept from the work of Abraham and Torek two Hungarian psychoanalysts who worked with the adult children of Holocaust survivors. And that is the concept of transgenerational haunting, which says that the unspeakable secret of one generation takes up residence in the unconscious of the next generation as a ghost. So I experimented with the methods of investigation for this project because traditional social science methods were very limited in what they allow us to perceive as well as what kinds of questions they allow us to ask. And Patricia made me think a lot about the unconscious. So where is the unconscious in social science research? How does the unconscious desire of the researcher shape the research subject and vice versa? How does the shame of the research subject impact what we can know and what we can maybe never know? And so that led me to exploring the unconscious through some unusual methods like dream work, thinking about the collective unconscious and also what Patricia called the sub-individual unconscious or the machinic unconscious. In other words, bodily perception that is not yet perceived by consciousness. And one of the ways in which I explored this was through doing performance. So I did these uh, performance pieces based on my research to sort of think about how to perform trauma and what happens with an audience when that trauma is reverberating between the person who is speaking, the voice that is speaking, and the audience that is receiving that information, and how to think about witnessing trauma in that way. Um, and this fits right in with Abraham and Torek's theory of transgenerational haunting, because the way they, they say that one can um, release the psyche's the ghost's grip on the psyche, 
is by relocating the private pain, that thing that is, was so shameful, and putting it into the, the public realm. And they use the language of performance, performing the taboo words, right? And so that's how you prevent these secrets from haunting generation after generation. And so this really became a part of my, my project as a scholar, as a writer, an academic, and as, as an artist, and as a person. So I've always lived by all of these principles, that it's really important to, um, to work on destigmatizing the things that people have felt too ashamed to speak about. Um, so as I was revising my dissertation into what became my first book manuscript, I also began to work as a performance artist with a, um, an art collective called Still Present Past, which was based on the oral histories of Korean war survivors and their children. So I'm going to read a quote from one of the, um, the second generation. This opened the exhibit. So it was the, the words that w they were printed on, like this sort of gauzy um, material, and people walked through the words into the exhibit. But it also opens my first book. It's the epigraph I used in my first book. And the quote is, my life seemed a lot like the lives of other kids around me, but there always seemed to be this tension and anxiety, which was sort of going through my family like an unhappy wind. There were silences, which became part of the fabric of our daily lives. And so as I was working with this, uh, with this art collective, working on these performance pieces that were based on these oral histories, I was also revising the dissertation to the book manuscript. And so they, it all sort of got woven together. Um, and what I ended up doing was sort of layering these voices together, weaving together my own voice and aspects of my family history with the voices from the oral, from the oral histories. And so the two projects kind of merged. And my first book was primarily an academic book, but it had all of these creative elements and it drew upon you know, many other voices, not just my own. But I didn't think of that book as a memoir, although it was really grounded in some of the things I had learned about my mother's past and my family history. Um, so here I'm gonna tell you another little anecdote about my, about my family and the opposition in my family. So when I had gotten a book contract to publish it, uh, one person in my family in particular who then enlisted others in my family um, sort of rallied around um, the effort to try to get me to stop me from doing this work, right? And so the, the, you know, this person made all of these threats saying, if you, if you publish this book, I'm going to tell everybody at your college that you're a pathological liar and insane. And I said, go ahead. I'm curious to see what will happen if you do that. And then they said, well, I'm never going to let you talk to my children. You're not going to have a relationship with my children. And I said, well, I don't really have a relationship with them anyway. <laughs> and then third, this person said, well, I'm going to tell your mother that you were going around telling everybody that she's a crazy prostitute. So, up until this point, I actually hadn't spoken to my mother about my research because I kept waiting for her to ask me what my dissertation was about, and she never asked me. And so there was this tension building and building, and the person who made these threats actually did say that to my mom. And so the next time I saw my mom, she said, are you writing a book? And so it opened the door for me to have a conversation with her about the book. And I told her, in my words, what the book was about. And I said to her, I won't publish it if you don't want me to. I wrote about all of this in Taste War, Like War as well. And she said, she paused for a second, but then she said, I want you to. And it allowed me to have this conversation with her in which I said to her, this part's not in Taste Like War, um, I want you to know that I know what you did for a living in Korea, and you don't have to be ashamed of it. She smiled a little bit, like I detected this little smile on her face. So I took that to mean that this was, for her also, an opportunity to be free, right? From all, from all of the stigma and the shame, 
The next several times I went to visit her after that, she would ask me about the book. When is the book coming out? Is your book done yet? Sometimes she would pull a book from my backpack and say, is this your book? And so I had to explain to her, no, it takes a long time. It takes a long time to get a book published and uh, the production process could take, you know, like months, years. I, had, I got the cover design. Two days later, she suddenly died. So that's when Taste Like War began. Because she died very unexpectedly. I didn't know what the cause of death was. There were many, many questions I still have about her death. But all of these images and memories of her started to come back to me. They were memories of her before she had schizophrenia. Like I said, my coming of age and my, my identity as a uh, young adult was so formed around her illness and the things that I thought that she couldn't do, that this completely changed everything. It completely changed my perspective of who my mother was, being able to recover those memories of her from my childhood. So originally I started to write just so that I would continue to remember them because I realized I had forgotten and I needed to write them down so that I wouldn't forget again. That was in 2008. In 2011, I got the notion that maybe I would actually write a memoir. And so I enrolled in a memoir workshop. I took some of these memories and started to craft them. And they were early versions of three of the chapters that are in Taste Like War. And then over the next few years, I, well, let me say, I actually worked on this very slowly. It took from the time my mother died until it came out in print in 2021, 12, actually almost 13 years had passed. Um, so first memories I wrote in 2008 after her death. The first memoir workshop was in 2011. And then I put it aside for four years because I had a child. So that, you know, so I didn't, I didn't do any writing for, for a couple of years then. Um, and then I returned to another memoir workshop in 2015. So four years had passed between the first uh, drafts of some of the early chapters to when I started to work on it again. Um, and interestingly, in 2015, I ended up in a workshop where, the, where I learned that it, it was not just sociology that had, um, had a lot of uh, disciplinary boundaries that I was crossing, that memoir also, uh, you know, followed, followed some of these same rules. And I broke a lot of the rules of memoir in the submissions that I, um, that I shared with the class. So you may have heard, if you've ever, if you're a writer yourself or if you've ever done a writing workshop, show, don't tell, right? So that's sort of a mantra in creative writing, show, don't tell. So I got that a lot, show, don't tell. A few years later, I came across a, um, a piece that was talking about how show don't tell is actually a very Western construct, right? Because it sort of privileges sight over other forms of perception. So it sort of made me rethink that a little bit. Um, the teacher I had in 2015 said over and over again, this was her particular mantra, one time, one place, one story. Um, as you heard in the introduction, the, the quote or the, uh, from the review of my book, that it was epic. It's an epic story. So it was definitely not one time, one place, one story. Um, and because it was really grounded in that earlier research that I did, that I described for my, my first book, the story is intergenerational. So the story wasn't just about me. This became a book about searching for the social roots of my mother's schizophrenia. And I wanted to go back in time. I wanted to think about, um, you know, legacies, various kinds of legacies. And sometimes I wanted my mom to be the pro protagonist of some chapters rather than me. Um, and so, you know, so the feedback that I got from these, these writing workshops sometimes was really useful, but sometimes I had to learn that, you know, I can be critical of the, of the orthodoxy of this type of creative writing as well. Um, so some of the feedback was really useful, and in particular, I did get one comment that said, I, I don't understand why you're saying that this is about searching for the social roots of your mother's schizophrenia, because schizophrenia is just biological. I thought all mental illness was just biological. 
And so that gave me a lot of information about where I, where I needed to guide the research, and it became one of the central um, focal points for my book to rethink schizophrenia not as something biological, but as something social. And I mean, the truth is that it is both, right? That mental illness is both biological and social, but that we still have this idea, even in the 2020s, that it's mostly biological. Um, and it's only been in the last um, 15 years or so that there's been more and more research looking at it as a social phenomenon. So that feedback was extremely useful to me because I knew that I needed to sort of explicitly address it in the book and not assume that readers thought the same way that I did. One comment that I got very frequently and one that I, you know, one piece of feedback that I did not incorporate into the book was that I, I would get a lot of comments in the margins that said, this part takes me out of the story. Generally, that's not a good thing, but I thought about it for a long time, and I realized that this was actually a device that I was using, and it was the effect that I wanted to achieve, because um, sometimes taking you out of the story was a way of mirroring the experience that I had in trying to make sense of my mother's life, and also trying to make sense of my own life, and realizing that you know, as a young person, so much of what I had been told had been a fiction, and that story was crumbling, right? And so I want the reader to be taken out of the story because I was not allowed to have that coherent narrative, right? And so um, it became actually a useful technique for me to take the reader out of the story. So the, the, you know, there are parts of the book, actually throughout the book, the, the, the narrative is somewhat uh, fragmented, in some places more than others, so sometimes they use it as this voice that disrupts the conversation to try to achieve something of the effect of what it's like to be a voice hearer who maybe can't focus on the actual person that's in front of them because their voices are interrupting them. Um, sometimes my mother's voices, like sometimes she would say something either to her voices or that her voices were asking her to say in the middle of a conversation I was having with her. Um, and sometimes that, that fragmentation is meant to, to disrupt that train of thought or, um, you know, or it's the revelation of the secret that shatters the fiction. So the chapters that I ended up fragmenting more were the chapters um, in the years 1986 and 1994, those two traumatic awakenings I spoke about earlier. And because, the, because those were the years when it really felt like I was in pieces. And so the chapters also had to be in, in pieces. And as I mentioned, there's quite a lot of research in this book. So some of it is drawn, on, um, drawn from my earlier research from my first book. And some of it is newer research that I did on the social roots of schizophrenia, as well as the, um, the effects of xenophobia on mental health. Because where I grew up, it was a very xenophobic um, part of Washington State. Um, and so sometimes I wove in the research as a way of having these two parallel versions of a narrator talk to each other. So one is the now narrator, who is the adult sociologist, and the other is the young narrator, who is trying so desperately to understand. So it's the, the adult now narrator who's trying to offer an explanation to the young narrator who can't understand. There's a lot of movement in time and space as well. So again, epic. But um, there's what I wanted to do was also sort of mirror the temporality of trauma, because trauma does not respect linear linearity at all, right? So um, the past is always in the present. The future is always in the present in the form of anxiety. So I wanted to do a little bit of that in the chapter, but what I did do, just so that the reader isn't totally confused, is try to anchor each, each chapter in one particular time and place. So each chapter has an anchor, and each, the anchors are somewhat um, linear, except that the overall structure of it is circular. So it begins, um, it begins a week after my mother died in her apartment in New Jersey, and the last chapter is a week before she died in that same apartment. So that's sort of the, you know, like what I wanted to say about the book. Um, 
I, the last thing I'll say is that I, in the prologue, I describe it as, to borrow Maggie Nelson's phrase, it's an unintended sequel to my first book. And what Maggie Nelson says about her, so she was writing about two of her books, Jane, which is about her aunt's murder, and then she wrote another book about the court case related to the, her aunt's murder. And she said, but she wrote in a third, a different book about <laughs> having written these two books, um, that she had to write that second book so that she could undo this knot and hand its strands to the wind. I quote her there, that, that particular quote, but I think of it differently because I don't, I actually don't believe that Maggie Nelson has handed those strands to the wind if she is talking about it also in the Argonauts. And I don't think that I've done that either. I don't think I've untied that knot and handed it to the wind um, because I think of it differently now. I think that there is some value in that knot and writing in the place of that knot because it is the Han itself, that sense of knotted grief and injustice that is what propels me forward to do the work. So there's some usefulness in it. And so now I rethink, of, rethink the knot, not as something that you need to disentangle and free altogether, but to disentangle enough so that you are not suffocated by it and to disentangle it enough to be able to see where all of these threads lead you, right? And that that in itself um, is the reason that I write. And so I think I will leave it at that. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you.